Alrighty, back to ELE 210 circuit theory. Um, here's a topic I completely uh, overlooked, and uh, actually there's two topics involved, but uh, this lecture will just do one. And that's the idea of resistive attenuators. Um, we know that resistors convert electrical energy to thermal energy immediately. Um, as long as it's all resistance, there's no distortion, there's no delay or change of phase or any of that kind of stuff. So, um, in electronic systems, we very often um, need to uh, maintain a given resistance. And you know, I'll, it's, it's, so easy, it's so easy to introduce impedance into systems because, you know, a little capacitance here and there, a little inductance here and there, you know, wires have inductance and wires near other wires have capacitance between them or, you know, a wire over a ground plane, there's a capacitive effect between the wire and the ground plane, that sort of thing. But um, in radio frequency systems, uh, you know, even from kind of low frequency the systems up to microwave um, and millimeter wave, <clears throat> um, these these systems uh, often want to uh, maintain a certain resistance so that they can transmit the power along transmission lines, which might be a, a coaxial cable, could be a twisted pair, could be anything. And I'm going to use the example of coaxial 50 ohm transmission line here. We will look at transmission lines for a, a lecture or, or a little more toward the end of the course um, just to give you an idea of, of the amazing things that can be accomplished with transmission lines. But um, what actually happens with a tr transmission line, it looks, um, if, it's, if it's really, if everything's really well done, let's say it's designed for a 50 ohm system and you have 50 ohms on one end of it when you look in the other end, you see 50 ohms. Um, the only thing is that a transmission line, um, even one that's lossless in our case here, and those are, of course, impossible to come by, but short transmission lines, you know, can, can approach being lossless. Um, the amazing thing is they do delay things because it, the speed of light, it takes time for uh, your, you know, the wave fronts from your electrical signal to when they in, impinge on one end of the transmission line they travel down the other end and then appear at the other end so um, a lot of times uh, you know people have to watch the length of the transmission line or make it uh, maybe you know take it into account in their system because even though it, it looks like a like a purely resistive uh, device up to some frequency um, it does delay the, the appearance of the signal at the other end. Um, so anyway, that's a transmission line. And that's not absolutely important for this discussion. It's just one of the areas where these attenuators uh, are, are seen very often. You've got coaxial cables. And I think if you take um, um, uh, Professor Millett's course, or if you are taking it in communications, um, he will talk about attenuators. The most important thing is that they're resistive, and uh, uh, within their proper frequency range, the parasitic uh, components, that is the things that you wish weren't there, um, there's capacitance in those things and inductance in those things, but up from, from DC, which we consider to be kind of like zero frequency, up to some uh, rather high frequency, these things look purely resistive. And all they do is kill power. They just take electrical energy, convert it into heat. And so you might think, well, what, what, why do we do those things? I mean, we learned about um, op-amp amplifiers, and we know that transistors can amplify and, and all that sort of thing. Um, why do we ever want to lose a signal? In some systems, um, you may be generating a power signal uh, something that's going to go to an antenna, or perhaps it's going to go to a transmission and drive a transmission line that's really long. Um, a good example of this would be, uh, although you don't see a lot of DSL anymore, um, you know, the, 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 
they make uh, op amp like drivers for DSL that drive those phone lines and drive all that stuff all the way down uh, to, to the uh, to the customers um, you know uh, premises and, and, and to their DSL modem and the DSL modem has one of those op amp like drivers that drives the signal all the way back up to the um, to the uh, 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 offices, the, the, the central office. So in driving that power, that's great, but when you go to measure it, you might want, not want to just drive that right into your measuring equipment, like your oscilloscope or something like that. It, it, may be, um, it may be too large a signal for that, or into a spectrum analyzer if you're looking at the frequency components of the signal. So um, very often in test situations, you might introduce this attenuator and as you can see excuse my my big hairy arm here but this this is our um, source here okay very thevenin like in nature but that's a, a, a lot of times that's the way we represent sources it has a you know some ac source here and a 50 ohm internal resistance it drives the transmission line and then it could drive the load directly but we stuck in a resistor network in here between the end of the transmission line and the load, and it's going to waste power for us. So let's take a look at this thing. If we had one volt peak to peak here at the output of our generator, and this is a lossless transmission line, you know, made of pure unobtainium, you get the one volt peak to peak out of here, and what happens is, or even if you got less, you know, let's just say you got one volt peak to peak out of, out of the end of this thing. If there were loss, it would be, you know, less. But, uh, um, but anyway, we have a volt peak to peak here. And now we look at this thing. What I got? I got uh, 50 ohms in parallel with, it, with another 50 ohms. That's 25 ohms, okay? And then I, that's in series with 25 ohms. So it, what I got is one volt peak to peak is still seeing 50 ohms just like it's seeing the load resistor but these resistors are burning up energy so that the load gets less energy all right and in this case um, the load voltage is going to be the voltage across the the two 50 ohm resistors in parallel that's in series with 25 ohms and you know you got a 25 ohm and 25 ohm voltage divider so i'm going to get half i'm going to get half a volt peak to peak and now, if we go to talk about the power that's delivered through this thing. Oh, by the way, you notice I called this an L-pad attenuator because it's an up, upside-down L. And it's a, it's a handy circuit for attenuating, um, uh, you know, uh, attenuating means diminishing the power and burning up power for me so the load only sees so much power. This, um, what's neat about this, this circuit here is, you know, we said it was 50 in parallel, 50 is 25 in series with 25, gives me a 50 ohm. So it still looks like a 50 ohm load, and uh, it just burns up power, and this guy over here, you know, just sees uh, uh, something coming uh, at him uh, with less voltage, and he's happy with that. So now... Um, we would like to um, analyze the power delivered to the load. We could analyze the power delivered to the load without the L pad. W O slash is some I learned that a long time ago and to mean without. I hope that's okay for everybody. But um, power to the load without the L pad would be the one volt peak to peak. Now that's a half a volt peak, and that's. 0.3535 volts RMS, and we have to use RMS for power calculations. And um, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna skip to sheet two for a second here. RMS is root mean square. So this this guy right here, this guy is RMS. Now, if you wanted to see how much power was in, say, a sine wave or any wave, one way to do that 
and this is vo it could be voltage or current. When we look at the equations for voltage or current, uh, I'm sorry, the equations for power, we can say that power equals um, current times voltage, all right? And we know that voltage is current times resistance. So that's equal to, now better yet, let's do it this way. That's equal to I times V is equal to IR, right? And so we get the, uh, one of the other forms is P equals I squared R, all right? And the other way of looking at this is to say that it's, um, now I is equal to V over R times V, and so we get V squared over R. But in either case, for these guys, I um, and V must be DC or RMS. And I'll show you why. If we want to look at the instantaneous power at some point here with this voltage, we would look at uh, this voltage and we would square it and uh, divide it by the resistance. Okay? And if we wanted to, you know, to the instantaneous power at this point, we would square the voltage and divide it by the resistance. Likewise, here, square the voltage, divide it by the resistance. Here, same thing. Over here, same thing. We square the voltage, divide it by the resistance. Now, if we want, uh, if this were DC, we would just have the voltage just be a straight line. And the average power, we could take the power at any instantaneous point as V squared over R, or I times R, or I squared times R, and we'd have the power. To do the same thing in a periodic, you know, AC waveform, we have to take all the instantaneous, now there's an infinite number of them, but there's a mathematical way to do this, we have to take all the instantaneous voltages and square them. And we're going to divide by the resistance, but since we're dividing by the resistance each and every time, we can save that to the end. We've got to take all these voltages and square them and divide them, then, you know, div take that total and divide it by R. And we get, we get the power delivered by um, a sine wave. And the sine squared waveform will look something like this, by the way. Okay. So um, now it's kind of kind of lumped over there. Sorry about that. But it's you know it, it will look something like. There, that's a little better. And this one. Likewise. What number could we use to be um, the equivalent of that would be the average power um, uh, delivered, delivered over this whole thing. And then we to get the voltage back, remember power is V squared over R, we're, if, you're, if we're using voltage, we have to take the average power and, div, and take the square root to get back to the voltage, okay? So the square root of the mean square means add up all these powers, square them, all right? And, and divide them by R, or again, we're gonna divide them by R at the end. So square all these powers, add them up, and then divide by um, the, the time in this one uh, cycle here, divide by the period of this thing, and you will get an average power. You take the square root of that, and you'll get an average voltage.
Okay, so the RMS voltage is the square root of the average square. 